student, P.O. Srinivastava. Uh, take it away. Uh, hi, thanks. Uh, thanks for the introduction. So, uh, should I should should I go ahead? Hello. Uh, should I go ahead? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So, uh, so um, some uh, I'm talking from the future, twenty third March here, uh, and uh, I'm going to I'm going to talk about uh, robustness of causal identification, um, if, and from the perspective of cause uh, from from a, a from the perspective of a classical notes in a numerical analysis called the condition number. Uh, but before that, let me just uh, introduce the notation in the setup. I mean, I'm sure everyone here is very familiar with this, but just to make sure we're all on the same page. So I'm going to be talking in the framework of, uh, of uh, Bayesian networks. So, uh, so there's problem here is that you have some observed distribution, but this observed distribution really is the marginal on some observed part of a, of a underlying Bayesian network that we don't have full access to. So this classical example from the work of Pearl uh, is about this thing where you see that there's a lot of correlation between smoking and lung disease. But then uh, to really say that smoking causes lung disease, you, you have to sort of remove the confounding effect of any other thing. And this is not just, a, this is not just something that uh, is theoretical. This was actually argued in court by a lawyer. So I think this person was a lawyer for uh, a particular company. Claiming that there's a theory or, or a hypothesis that deals with people's personalities, the same thing that causes people to smoke may predispose them to lung cancer. So, to get to the point from uh, to get to the point from here where you see correlations to here, uh, where you can do, uh, say that smoking causes lung disease, you you typically need to do an experiment. And the question is, uh, when can you do without the experiment? Can you uh, can you find can you can you get from here to here without doing an experiment just from the observational data? So, uh, so the setup, uh, the technical setup for this uh, is a Markov model with some nodes hidden. So there are some nodes, some hidden nodes which we know are there, but which we cannot measure. Uh, and the observed distribution is you first take the usual Bayesian factorization, usual Bayesian length factorization on the full graph, but then you only observe the things on the observed nodes. So in this case, x, z, and y, uh, and you marginalize out the hidden nodes. So that's the observed distribution. Uh, that of course does factorize in some way. In this case, it's just a trivial factorization. Uh, but it's it, uh, but yeah, because the hidden node is missing, you don't have the full Bayesian factorization. So and then the question uh, you know, on the first slide becomes something like this: that you have the observed distribution, which is this full marginal, including this term, where the the dependence of x on the hidden variable. And from this, you want to go to the go to this, which is the in the so-called experimental or intervention distribution, where you do an intervention, so whether you say whether a person person is smoking or not, uh, without any effect of the genetic factor or any other factor, and then you want to see whether lung disease happens or not. And that, if you assume that this is the correct physical model of reality on the left, uh, is going to be just uh, this here, the the uh, the uh, uh, the, fa the factorization on the right hand side with the, the uh, p of x given you removed. And then the identification problem is when is this right hand side expression computable given just the observed distribution? So that's the identification problem. Uh, it's not always possible, but sometimes it is. So, in particular, in the model I showed you, it's one of the first examples. So, it's, it's where it is. So, you can actually get the intervention distribution from just the observed distribution. So, notice it on the right hand side. You only have observed margins, things that can be computed as functions of the observed margins, and here you have the two distribution. So somehow you, you are able to remove the effect of you. So uh, so the so this problem was studied for a long time uh, on when it can be done, when it cannot be done. So the general the goal is that you're given the graph, you know the locations of the hidden factors, but you don't you don't measure them, and what you want is uh, this algorithm which will take the graph. The set of nodes on which you want to perform the intervention, x here, the set of nodes y on which you want to see the response. So this is y. And these need not be single nodes, they might be sets of nodes. And what this algorithm should do is output a symbolic formula. And the symbolic formula should take as input the observed marginals and then output the intervention distribution, which, which corresponds to removing all the incoming edges into the control into the intervention variables. Okay. So 
So one thing I want to emphasize is that the goal here was to find an algorithm that outputs an algorithm so, or a formula. So the algorithm itself outputs a formula that will take as input the numerical P, the observed marginals, and then output the numerical value of the intervention distribution. Uh, so this is a very exact or logical sort of problem. And then there's a numerical part which comes afterwards of plugging, plugging in the observed marginals. And it took a long time uh, to finally come up with a sound and complete version of this algorithm that output this formula. And it was achieved in, the, uh, so after a long line of work, solving several in interesting special cases or solved solve these two papers by Spitzel, Pearl, and Huang, Walter, um, And uh, it does exactly what it says here. So uh, given a graph, it will either say that such a formula does not exist, or if the formula exists, it will output the formula. And then the formula has to be applied to P, as I said, to find the final numerical answer. And uh, in all of this, uh, to find this uh, formula, the graph is known, assumed to be known exactly. And then uh, to do this computation, P, the marginal, this uh, marginal table here, is known to is assumed to be known exactly. So that's the set. Okay. So what's the robustness question? So the first obvious robustness question is about the numerical stability of the second step. So the, you have you have you have saw, you have run this combinatorial algorithm. It has given you the formula, and now you're going to plug in this P, and but this P is being measured or being tampered with in some other ways. So there might be some errors here. So the original actual P might look like this, uh, and then some digits might be off. And the question is how much do these small errors, how do these errors propagate as you apply this formula? So that's the first kind of stability question that one can ask. The second question is about model stability. So suppose that, I mean, we had this model uh, that, and we made an assumption here. And the assumption was that there is no edge from U to Z, that whatever this hidden factor is, it cannot cause star in lungs. So it, if the hidden factor is affecting both smoking and lung disease, it will not cause star in, star in lungs also. But maybe that assumption is not true. And perhaps there is an edge there also. And if that edge was present, if that U to Z is edge was present, then this, this, this identifiability goes away. Then you cannot write down this ID uh, GXY as a function of P. Uh, and the ideal algorithm would correctly fail in that case. So it will just say that the formula does not exist. But perhaps if the influence of this edge was somehow weak, maybe we shouldn't be so pessimistic. We shouldn't just say fail. And we should just try to quantify the error of having ignored such a weak edge rather than just giving up. So that's a second kind of stability. So these are the two kinds of stability uh, we want to look at. Okay. So, uh, any questions at this point? If not, I have a question. Can you see my pointer on the screen or not? Yes. Okay. Okay. So uh, we'll study both of these notions using a classical measure of stability from uh, uh, from numerical analysis, which is the condition number. So here I've just defined it informally. So if you have any function f and it's being evaluated at some numerical point p, the condition number is a measure of the relative error in the computation as res with respect to the relative error in the input. So the, you look at that error in p, error in the f of p compared to the actual value of p compared to the same kind of relative error in p. So p might be a vector, so here I put a norm. So let's not be very uh, careful right now about what norms here and so on. But this is so the, the rough idea of the condition number is that you want to uh, quantify the relative error in the output in terms of the relative error in the input. Uh, the precise definition is more or less the same. It looks like this. So you, you look at small errors. So you have to look at it in the limit of small errors. And uh, the relative error is exactly defined as I said. So it's an error divided by the actual magnitude. And then you look at the relative error in the output divided by the relative error in the input in the limit of small relative error in the input. So why is this uh, quantity interesting? And this can be extended component twice for that. Why is this, comp uh, this quantity interesting? So it's, as I said, it's a classical notion in numerical analysis and it's, uh, it's, it can be used, uh, it can be justified as a measure of loss of precision. So when you're doing floating point computation, so the way IEEE 754 works, so when you use double or float, in any uh, standard computer language, uh, programming language. Uh, the log of the condition number sort of measures the number of digits of precision that are lost when you use floating point computation uh, to compute it. So it's not like 
this is exactly the number of digits operation lost it's sort of more or less like a lower bound than digits operation that are that are lost so i won't go into detail here but uh, this is sort of a classical thing and because of this uh, interpretation it is very well studied especially in the context of uh, numerical algorithms in linear algebra in fact so well studied in that context that often when people say condition number what they actually mean is the condition number of solving a linear system and you might have seen that as the ratio of the top and the bottom singular values so that is that definition of the ratio of singular values comes from this more uh, maybe first principles definition it happens to be that in the case of solving linear systems and uh, it's a very rich theory uh, a lot of numerical algorithms uh, and their performance can be studied in this context uh, this is very there's a very nice book with a somewhat philosophical title uh, by you know, Bridges and Kipper, which, uh, which is, uh, okay, so so this classical notion exists. So what what about it? So we can certainly use it for our purposes. We have a numerical problem, and we can try to see what the condition number is. But just that would not be good enough. It turns out that the condition number in the case of uh, in our setting, in the case of identification, also turns out to be related to model stability. And in particular, small condition number, which is what would mean that the loss of friction is small in the numerical analysis setting, also means that the effect of uh, adding extra weak edges is small. Okay. So, uh, so what this means uh, is from some previous work uh, is that if you have a weak edge and a weak edge is given by uh, by this kind of condition, what this condition is saying is that if you change the value, if you change the value at the head of the edge. Then the distribution, the conditional distribution of the tail does not change much in a relative sense. The logs, so instead of logs, you can just think of the ratio being bounded with, between one plus minus one plus minus epsilon. And uh, one can show quite easily, in fact, that if you have a graph, so you have a graph like this where which is where x, y, two x is not identifiable. But if you remove the edge use it, then it is identifiable. And further, if you know that the edge that you are removing to make the model identifiable is weak. And you also know that the ID has small condition number, then the value does not quite change. So you can just run ID on the in this wrong graph, which has uh, the edge removed, and output that as your answer, and it would be still quite a good approximation to y dx. Now, uh, at this point, you should be suspicious. Like uh, G in, I said that in G, this identity, this y dx is not even identifiable. So what does this even mean? Well, it is. Uh, not identifiable, but it has a definition in terms of if you knew the full graph with the hidden variables, this value exists. And what this is saying is that no matter what the hidden variables are doing, if this weak weakness assumption is correct, then all the possible values of this p of y to x will be close to the value that you get by computing on this. So that means that small condition numbers are good, uh, not just from the point of numerical stability, but also from the point of view of model stability. So then the question we ask is, uh, what's the condition number of causal identification uh, in the setting? So you're given the graph G, the intervention variables X, the, the, fine, the, um, the response variables Y, and, uh, and we want to find out what the condition number is. Okay. So I'm going to study it in, the, in this gen generic setting where you, I'm uh, sort of assuming that uh, each uh, variable has a discrete Setup and I have nothing, nothing about distributions at all except that they follow the Bayesian network. But if you are in a in a setting of more slightly more parameterized setting like linear, linear structural equation models, there also this notion has been studied. So uh, in particular, you can see this paper by Sankaraman, Lewis, and, Lewis and Goyle. But I would not be looking at this setting. I would work, I would work um, complete in the setting of uh, variables which where there is no such parameter assumption. Slightly parameter. Okay, so before I proceed, uh, I'll just put a quiz here. So here's almost a trivial model. Uh, what is this trivial model? So there are just two kinds of nodes, the S nodes and the X nodes. And there's a hidden variable sitting in between each two consecutive S nodes. So there's a hidden variable sitting here between S1 and S2 and so on, between S2 and S3, S3 and S4 and so on. So there's between every two is one hidden node. I've removed the hidden node, I've just put the bidirected edge there. And uh, of course, P of X to S is identifiable in this. It's pretty easy to show that, and pretty easy to also compute this value. And uh, the question is, uh, what do you think is the condition number for this trivial model? Does it grow linearly with N? Is it independent of N? 
or does it have some other behavior? And you can assume that the observed marginal P is just uniform. So let's say you're in a really trivial setting where the marginal we observe is just the uniform um, distribution and assume that all the SIs and XIs are bits and P is uniform distribution over all these two n bits. Okay. So we'll come back to this question uh, later. So, uh, so, so to just to come to the result, so that uh, so uh, so the first question we ask is: Are there any important classes where the condition number is small? So, so, so there are, and in particular, one nice class turns out to have not too bad condition number. So, if the C component, so recall that a C component in a such a uh, semi-Markovian model is a so a C component is a component like one of these, like the yellow one, where all if you just look at the bidirected edges, which is the sort of the hidden edges while ignoring the hidden variables, the C components are the connected components induced by those bidirected edges. So in this case, A, X, Y, W, B are connected because you can go from A to X, X to W, W to B, just following the hidden edges. So, so that's what a C component is. And when the sizes of all the C components are small, uh, the condition number is not too large. So if each, uh, if you have a graph of N observed nodes, each C component is size most C, uh, and at least for positive p, the condition number for call identification for which it's the, the, the identification identifiability actually holds is n times something that depends upon the size c. Uh, so this is not tight. Uh, we'll come to see later. This is not tight, but at least this gives us a bound. And there are the other uh, settings also where condition numbers are small. So in particular. Uh, in this setting, which was studied by Tian and Pearl on the road to the full identifiability result uh, in 2002. Uh, so this is a setting when X is a single node and no child of X is in the same C component as X. Uh, so in this setting also, uh, again, the condition number is small. It's odd. There's some, at least some simple settings, the condition number is small. Okay. So, so, but these are all, okay. So this one is probably quite general, the small C components. The second one is somewhat specific, but still it's an interesting case because um, it was an important special case to be solved. Uh, the but with, with these results, uh, the question we have to ask is, how does an algorithmically estimate the condition number? So, uh, so, so, so this, uh, it turns out one can write down exact expressions for it. Although those expressions might be hard to, uh, deal with computation and uh, dealing with them efficiently is some open is, is uh, some open problem for future work. But the result is is this. So if you have any causal graph and positive p uh, such that p of y do x identify, the condition number can be written in terms of the gradient of the log of the function. So i d g of x y is some is a remember it's a formula. Uh, it's a formula whose input is the probability vector p. So you look at the log of the formula, look at the gradient of that, and you think of the entries of the gradient, and uh, you assign a weight to each end. So each entry of the gradient corresponds to one of, so omega is the, is the domain of P. So P is a probability distribution uh, with on elements of omega. And uh, so the entries of the gradient are also indexed by that. And you look at the entries of the gradient, uh, the log of the gradient, uh, weighted by P, and uh, you look at the expectation of that. Uh, so you, it's sort of a, there was one uh, like the L1 variant. So the minimizer here would be the median. So you just look at the median of the entries of gradient factor, but the median is not just the usual median, but with respect to P. So as I said, the entries are indexed by omega. Each omega comes with weight P of omega. And with these weights, you will look at the median of the entries of the gradient and then take the expectation uh, of the deviation from that. So this is somewhat of a mouth, mouthful, but it easily, for example, follows that uh, condition number is therefore also uh, bounded by the square root of the variance of the entries of the gradient. Again, uh, when you look at the entries as being sampled from with respect to this probability distribution. Uh, okay. So, uh, so any, any questions about the two results so far? Okay, so so maybe now let's answer the quiz. So, uh, and uh, to, uh, let's take into the next part of the talk. So, uh, so the quick question, remember, was we had this somewhat trivial-looking model, uh, two kinds of nodes, S and X, S1 to Sn and X1 to Xn, 
there's a directed edge from each SI to the corresponding XI, and there's a hidden variable between each SI to each SI to SI plus one. Uh, so why did it is there? And we wanted to look at the condition number for computing uh, for the condition number for computing this expression, which is x probability of x equal to zero, and on the intervention s, all the s are set to zero. So the first uh, step is to just see that is, I mean this is, this is a trivial model, so it's, it's trivial. So it's, the identification problem is also trivial. In fact, it's, it's so trivial that the ID expression is just a conditional distribution. So, so the p of x to s is just p of x given s. But it can also be written in a slightly different form. You can factorize it further using the other, the, because this model supports more condition independences. So this is also equal to, the, as i goes from 1 to n, the probability that xi equal to 0 given s i equal to 0, and then the product from 1 to n. OK. So, so now maybe I, I can ask the quiz again. The quiz was what are what how does the condition number grow for this? So, so it so actually it turns out that getting some bounds is not so difficult. So it's some quite easy to actually see that the condition number of the first one here, the first expression is is uh, is is a constant. It's both upper and lower bounded by a constant. That's what this notation theta one looks. For the second one, it's also easy to show that it's at least upper bounded by n for order n, about two times n. Uh, so they are quite different. And it turns out, uh, which is maybe somewhat strange, that the correct answer, even in this trivial case, uh, is square root n. So, so the first one, the first expression, the, the condition number is constant. Second expression, the condition number is about square root n. Although the trivial things would say it's about order n, so even this trivial model, the condition number can behave in somewhat strange, in a somewhat strange uh, way. And the other thing I want to highlight is that there are these two equivalent expressions that are easily seen to be equivalent in this case uh, for the ID expression, and they have very different condition numbers. One is a constant, and the other one is growing within. So, uh, so, so even in a, a trivial model like this, the condition number seems to uh, behave in a very uh, different way, in a somewhat non intuitive way. So, any questions about this? So, so if not, maybe uh, before giving the proof sketches, maybe I'll, let me just mention a few, uh, uh, a few. Uh, Future directions before I come to the proof sketches. So, uh, uh, so, so, is, so what we have seen so far is that uh, that order and condition number and C composite sort of constant size, but these are not tight. Even that trivial example showed that, and two so bounding the condition number for any given instance. And there was some surprise even in trivial in example that a condition number may show non-intuitive behavior even in trivial instances. So, uh, so there are many. Uh, Future things here. So the expressions I showed you, uh, I'll see how I will show you how they were derived soon. But the expressions I showed you, uh, they're not so efficient to compute. I mean, we can uh, we can sort of do it by hand in some some examples. Uh, so so the question of finding more efficient algorithms for approximating the condition number would be nice. so. The idea would be that given a model, as soon as you have the model, you should be able to evaluate at least some good estimate of its condition number, because that lets you evaluate both the, the sensitivity of the model to ignoring weak edges and also the sensitivity to numerical perturbations. Thing. And uh, one uh, direction in this context that, uh, that I think might be quite interesting is that there's, a, there's some work on simplifying ID expression. So the ID algorithm is one algorithm that takes uh, the graph and outputs a formula for the intervention distribution. We already saw in even in this trivial example. So even in this trivial example, that uh, if, even this trivial example that you can have two uh, very two sort of different ID expressions which are equivalent in the sense that on the manifold of the probability distribution that are supported by the model, they are equal, but they behave very differently with respect to perturbations. So the condition number can be very different for those two. So so this. So this work on uh, simplifying uh, ID expressions, uh, this could 
possibly so condition number could possibly play, play a role here so when you are trying to define this notion of what is a simpler id expression the condition number could be one uh, parameter to decide between two different equivalent id expressions uh, the second uh, question is the second kind of thing so uh, that where the condition number might help and where which is again open and should be quite interesting is that uh, there's work on uh, using extra information so maybe the model is not identifiable but perhaps if you're if you are given some more extra information perhaps you're giving some other so you cannot do the experiment that you re so you want to identify the effect of x on y you cannot do that experiment but maybe you can do the experiment of looking at the effect of some other variable z on y and there's work on trying to use information like this where you have some extra say, experimental data available on uh, on putting bounds on the on some identifiable or even non identifiable uh, um, uh, intervention distribution so the question would be that is by using this extra information which could be in the form of extra experiments or more observations uh, can you can you make the problem more stable uh, and so can you change can you decrease the condition number by using extra information so this is something that we have not uh, looked at so far at all but it looks very interesting especially given the work on um, this using extra information for identifiability. Okay, so uh, so with that, I uh, let me just give you know about I think three or four minutes I have uh, just a brief sketch of the proofs. Um, so uh, so for the for this theorem, uh, which gave the corollary in terms of the variance, uh, the proof turns out to start with. Uh, something uh, so I just use f for the id just to keep the notation simple. Uh, so the so the sort of the only sort of interesting step here is to use some water standard ideas from numerical analysis. But in when you specialize them to this setting, it turns out that you can write the condition number as a linear program. Uh, and once you have a so the linear program might look somewhat unmotivated, but it just turns out that you you can at least you can get to this form. But once you have a linear program, there is in interesting tools one can use. In particular, one can use duality. And as soon as you use, so after you've done the hard work of actually getting to the linear program, just a mechanical process of going to the dual uh, gives you that result and uh, and the corollary also. So, so, so this uh, was this. the second one. I will not go into more detail, except that I will just say that there's some at, when you're not trying to be tight. So here we wanted an exact expression for the condition number. We wanted equality and got tight bounds. Uh, but when you're not trying to be that exact, there's a simple calculus for condition numbers, which sort of looks like the calculus for logarithmic derivatives. So the condition number product is the sum of the condition number. Condition number sum is the max. Condition number of composition multiplies and so on uh, under certain conditions. Uh, so for details, you can see the paper. Uh, and uh, this result is sort of based on using this, this calculus, except that you have to be a bit careful uh, to exploit this bounded. Condition. So the, there's no bound here on how many nodes you're intervening on or how many nodes you are looking at the response. So you have to be a bit careful uh, in. Uh, in the induction by using these things, but uh, but that's how the proof goes. The proof sort of tries to use these this this calculus for condition number throughout the ID algorithm, so propagates the ID algorithm carefully to make sure that the C component side is being handled correctly. Uh, okay, and uh, the one thing I would want to say that these calculus rules are not tight. As I said earlier. So the quiz example already shows that. The, so the calculus rules will tell you that the condition numbers are at most order n and the correct answer is square root n. Okay, so uh, so with that, uh, let's just end. Thanks.